Uh, my name is Shams bin Muhammad, and uh, today I'm going to present chapter six and possibly chapter seven of the book R for Data Science. So let's see what will happen. If time permits, we can jump up to chapter seven and finish it. If not, then we can, yeah. So this is the introduction. Uh, chapter six basically is a workflow of scripts and chapter seven is the EDA. So if time permits, we will see to the end of it. And uh, largely I will be using RStudio for some demonstration rather than using a lot of slides. And uh, this is my first time of doing this and uh, so I'm a beginner if anything goes wrong. Yeah, just it's a learning process and you can correct me. All right, let's jump to chapter six. So um, in chapter six, hardly we can uh, explain why we should stop using console or rather the, uh, be using script editor. As we already know, like script console, this console is mainly used for exploration and the script editor if you have a project. So you better do your work with script editor and uh, of course, script editor also, it has an advantage in which it saves your document when you uh, click the RStudio and automatically loads it. And uh, it's, he said it's better for one to be saving his document. So uh, when he says edit a script editor, so both R Markdown and script editor, when you open file script, they are all script editor, right? I'm asking question. Both when I click open R Markdown and open scripts, all the R Markdown document and the script editor, they are all script editor, right? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Ah, okay. What I mean by this is like, you see, um, here when I go open script, open up to open R Markdown. So, uh -huh. when I, so here, this, this environment is also script editor. <laughs> Very yeah. good question. Yeah. Yeah. What well, is your script editor where you can basically add things to your script or run things? Yeah. Whereas at like the bottom that. you see where it says restoring uh, okay. blah, blah, blah. That's yeah, your so, console. Yeah. So here in the console, right? Yeah. This is our console, right? So this. Yeah. So what I'm saying, this is R Markdown. So this editor for R Markdown. And this is another editor, which is not R Markdown. It just, I open here, file, script. So both this environment and this environment, they are all script editor, right? That's my question. Okay, okay cool. So um, uh, how did you also explain the very short code that we should be using every time in editor? That is the first one, control enter to run the code and control shift S to run all the, oh, uh, to, to run all the, document. So if we have document here, we can configure control enter. Here we can run this. And uh, if we have uh, control shift S, uh, we can uh, run all the, the, uh, the script in the editor. So uh, he also main mentioned that uh, whenever you are writing script in the editor, make sure you write all your uh, packages, libraries here at the top. So yeah, sometimes I Basically, when I'm writing some scripts in editor, I write it whenever I want. For instance, when I'm writing and uh, I need to use something, I just write, I just write the import the library, but uh, I don't know, like, is it necessary? Or this is the practice you guys have been doing that all, for instance, in your script, if you have like uh, uh, 10, I mean, packages, do you really import them at the beginning or you just import them along the way as you come? What do you think, what are you doing, you guys? Um, I always import them at the beginning. But sometimes you may come to you, and sometimes you may start, uh, you want to do something. I say, ah, okay, I need to do this package. So mm. do you import the package at the moment, very moment you want to execute that script or you go back to the beginning of those packages and import it there and run all, maybe you have, you have 15, you add it along with the 15 to the system and you run them and go back to it. What would be the best way? So, so basically, um, 
the, the main reason for importing your, your, your libraries or your packages at the start of the script, uh, it, it's, not, it's, it's not really for you. It, it's more of like when you have collaboration or you're sharing your script, then it's going to be easy for other people to know yeah. what it is they need. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. All right. So I'm just curious to know the best practices you guys have been doing. Okay. So he made mention also that um, don't, uh, when you install packages, and so don't use this in your script. Yeah, so uh, chapter one, six, and it does has exercises that he asked us to do. So he said, this is your question. Go to the Art Studio Tips Twitter at this. Find one tip that looks interesting, practice using it. I went there and look up some of these seven that I just picked up to show in this year. So the first one is image clipper. What does this mean? So this image clipper, what it does is basically uh, here. So you see in, uh, in our markdown, you don't need to use the code. If you, for me, like I sometimes basically forget a lot of things. So one thing you can do is to, why is my, oh, okay. Oh, excuse me. Uh, how can I hide this? Uh, uh, I actually don't know. Um, I, I, that, that's something I'm here to figure out. Uh, best case scenario, what I do is I just move the, the whole window a little bit down and... Yep, okay, I think. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so if you want to insert an image, just come here. I insert, this is a plugin, this image clipper. So when I go to here, I have like... Um, so if I have this, insert this inside image. So this will inbox something. It will allow you to download the image you want to input. Yeah, something like that, like this. And it will allow you here, copy file to the project. If you say it, it will copy that file to the existing project. So files already exist because I've already, yes, overwrite it. And what, enter the caption of it, the caption of the project. So for example, this, and here it will import your picture. So when you run it, so automatically, yeah. So this is one of the thing, script outline. So this is another uh, tips that I've seen in the Twitter. What basically it does is now, as we can see now in our Markdown, when, you when we have this here, we have our outline here. And this is what showed the outline also. This window, little window, in mark if we press command shift, or it will yeah, emerge. So uh, I think in Windows, I don't know. So this is the outline we see for it. So we don't need to be scrolling like this if we have a lot of backlines. So we can just be clicking at this and go there. But what about in scripts? This is our markdown. In scripts, this is how it does. So if you have several sections, what you can do is put hash section one and four hash at the end of it. Hash here one and the four hash at the end. So you can see here, section one, section two. Or you can put four hash and another four hash. So you can have this sequence section three, section four. So this is two ways in which you can actually uh, have uh, uh, outline in your script. But what we have here in our markdown, only one, one or two. One will create header, and two will create subset section, and three will also create subset section. So if it is script, only script here is different from our markdown how to create an outline. Another one is, uh, yes. Hello? Yes. There, 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 is, there is one extra one when it comes to our script. Yes. Uh, so, so actually you told me something new here. This one? Uh, no, no, no. If you go to code. Okay. If you just, uh, I don't know the, command, the, the, the shortcut, but if you go to code up there, yeah. Uh, in, in, in the, um, the menu nice. or whatever. Um, up, up, no, after file edit code. File code here. Okay. Yes, then you say insert section right at the top. Okay, here. Uh, yeah. So you can name like section one, section two. Yeah. Uh, but the thing, the thing is that this is quite long because of the dots. Like, how many are those? <laughs> so, yeah. So I mean, the dashes. So this one also works on 
what I'm saying is, um, let's see, but this one will not work on scripts, all right? It, what will work on script, as you can see? Oh, it work, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so this one, yeah. So this is another cool thing. Then another one I found is art theme. So this art theme allow you to customize your, uh, your art studio. Uh, I mean, themes in your art studio. So like this is the package art theme when you insert that. So for instance here, if I have here, these are some of the command in the theme. No? For instance, so art theme. So it will allow you to see many themes. You can see them different themes and uh, you can enter blank to skip and, and you can play, keep, to keep that or you come to write it. So if I enter, it can another one. You can change this theme. So you can select each one if you want to paper write one. So you can mm -hmm. click F, you can put F. If you paper write it, you can come to add in. When you come to, no, okay, when you come to add in, you have, uh, uh, so sort, you can set your paper right, you can, I mean, define those ones you need. So for instance, here, you can, we can see the list of all, okay, quit. Yep, so when I quit, it bring me to the uh, one I've been using. So here you can see the list of, so this is another one that I found really interesting. Then another package is R Recover, which when you install it, when you are R Studio, I mean, sometimes it crash or something like that, this will allow you to recover your stuff. Another thing we allow scroll past end of document. So now if we have this, uh, if we have this, can you see here in our studio here, I can move along up to, I mean, if you have our studio open, can you scroll, can you see, can you scroll past up to where you are working on? So there is this thing here. If you come to appearance uh, display, if we cl click here, allow, scroll past end of document. If you check it, you can say applied. Okay, so can you see, we cannot scroll. Can you see we stop at five only? Can you see we stop at five only? But when I said this, appearance, and of code, appearance, uh, no, appearance, display, allow scroll past end of document, applied, okay. Can you see I can scroll? So this is another one. And finally, Alt plus arrow up. So sometimes we may have code that I write this, uh, I want to copy this one and put it in top and array arrange. So if you highlight this and press Alt and up arrow, it will move to the code up. Yeah, Alt, scroll up, down. Yeah, so no more copy and paste here and close all current except close all except current. So I find this one I have not been using, I don't know. So if you want to close all your, you open many tabs and you want to close everything, but only this editor you are using, you don't want to close, then you can say close all except current. So these are basically things that, uh, question one I uh, managed to find. Then the next thing is uh, question two, is say what other common mistakes will our studio uh, diagnostic reports? So, R Studio reports many diagnostics when you are using it. So the first one is um, here. You can see when you write this, this is not well-defined expression or command. So it will see something like this. What, why this happened? It reports the problem here. X is not unexpected. The expected white space. Why expected white space? Because in R style, be defined by Hadley in Tidyva style document, which is this. This is a style guide by uh, Tidyva style guide. So the Tidyva style guide, if you do not follow that one, it is incorporated in Tidyva. So you will see that style error. So all of them are here. So these are some of the errors in in the uh, uh, Tidyva uh, style. And this, if you look at this one here, Oh, okay, these are several errors. Enable diagnostic function call, check arguments to R function. So this one, if 
you have defined a function, we have two variables, x and y, x plus y. And you call that function with only one argument instead of two, you will see an error. Also here, one if variable use has no definition in scope. So here we define a variable hw, but here we are using another variable hw with capital letter, which is not this. So this hw is not defined, it's not the scope. One, one if variable is not defined, but use. Also another one here, we have a function, number one, number two, and uh, we have a result which actually sum number one and number two, and it returns number one and number two. But if you see here, result is defined, but it's not being used inside the function. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it returns an error. You will see this is highlighting the error. So, if we use this variable result here, we will not see this an error. And okay. also, we have pro R provides stylistic diagnostic guide, which is based on Hadley Wickham style guide, which is this. So why do we have error here? This is actually correct expression, but the Tadiva style guide says you should leave a space between these operators. So you should have two, I mean space plus space plus place something like that. So there are many other. Uh, stuff like that. If you check this page, it explains well what they mean. So that is that for uh, 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 chapter six. So in Tidy Vice uh, style guide, how do you say good coding style is like correct pronunciation? You can manage without it. So, yep, of course, we can write our code without any style guide, but it can work like charm, but I mean, you know, when somebody is speaking grammar without pronunciation, so if, I mean, English speakers, you know, they would, you know, that's it. And um, there's another package called Styler package. What this package does is, um, is, yeah, this is the package. This package, when you install it, it allows, it will rearrange your code. And I think I was asking you this question, Alan, the other day, that is there anything that actually format your, Codes to be in, I mean, standard way. So I come across this one. So mm -hmm. this package, if you write your code, not in tidy bars style guide, when you write it, it will rearrange everything in your code to that. Well, another one that works is format R by Yongwei or Xiongwei. What is that name? What is name? Yongwei or I don't know. Uh, format R is also another package that does that. So. That is that about that uh, about chapter six. So, okay. any question about that? Any well, question? On, I, okay. I, don't, I don't have any questions. Okay, so I think we can move on to chapter seven. So, so uh, chapter seven is about EDA, which is uh, one of the top uh, uh, tools that we use when we want to. And do any modeling tax. So here you see, before you do any modeling tax, exploratory data analysis portion is one of the first thing you need to do. When a, wherever you are given a data, the first thing you need to do is just peep inside the data, see what it is concerned. Look at the missing data. Look at the what are the uh, uh, continuous variable, what are the categorical variables, and stuff like that. So they say here, EDA is creative process. The key to answering quality question is generate a large quantity of questions. So in EDA, there isn't any defined rules or format that when you follow it, you will achieve great, I mean, explorative data is creative. I mean, the more you do some analysis, the more you become creative at doing it. So this is just an art, like someone that is doing, I mean, singing, I mean, when he sings more, then, so he will become good at it. So EDA is something that is creative. But as we said here, EDA is creative. The key to asking quality question is to generate a large quantity of question. But this large quantity of question does not necessarily mean you will have an answer. That is why John Taki said the data may not contain answer at all. The combination of some data and arcane desire for an answer does not ensure that a reasonable answer can be extracted from a given body of data. So this is something we should put in our mind that it is not always when we generate those kind of large questions that we want to do on our data that we will answer all of them. 
So you can generate 10 questions, I mean, 11 questions, 12, and you can have answers to only two, three, four, five, and stuff like that. And we know who John Turkey is. So, um, so that's why Hadili also made a mention that there is no rule about which questions you should ask that to guide your research. But two things you should know, variation and covariation. So given your variable, given your data, look at the variables. What is the changes that occur within a particular variable? And now the next thing, look at the changes that can occur between those variables, between variables, existing variables. So this is one of the ways in which we can actually perform EDA. And also another thing that I have read in uh, thing that uh, actually uh, simpler way to do EDA is there are three top most steps to do EDA. One of the most crucial is look at the raw data values. Yeah. So what do we mean by look at the raw data values? Given your data, just open the data before you do anything. Just use view like the way we do in R. You I mean, use view to open the data, look at it, look at the data, look at the columns, look at how many uh, continuous variables you have, how many categorical variables you have, what kind of analysis you're gonna work, what kind of computing, because uh, the next thing you're gonna do after looking at the data is to compute summary statistics. But before you compute summary statistics, you must know what kind of data you have. I mean, are they categorical variable? How many, I mean, um, uh, how many are the uh, continuous variable? And after that, you look at the data. The next step you're gonna do in EDA is compute summary statistics. So summary statistics allows, such as mean, median, interquartile range, it allows you to give you an idea of what your data is. So just compute summary statistics, and uh, the last things after that, then you create data visualization. So, uh, these are the steps that are actually truly useful to uh, do uh, EDA. So these steps, I, they are not inside this book. Uh, I take it from uh, this book. What is the name of the book? Yeah, this book, uh, uh, Modern Drive. Can you see it? Yeah, so it's both, they said, these are the most uh, step, crucial step to do that. And uh, when I read this chapter, I find that, yeah, this is really helping to put this in mind, this test. First of all, look up the data. The next step, compute summary statistics, and now find a visualization of those uh, variables. <clears throat> okay, cool. Yeah, so the first thing as we need mention is to find any changes between inside your existing variable. So variation, as you see, is a tendency of the values of a variable to change from measurement to measurement. So when we have another, a, a variable such as continuous, or N1, now uh, we will have that changes that may occur. So, um, categorical variable is in that chart, and we're gonna see how we can find variation when uh, our uh, variable is continuous. So let's use this. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so this is it. So as I, we have said here, uh, variation within one variable allow you to see changes in one variable. So that variable may be categorical and it can be continuous. So when it is categorical, we use bar chart to show changes in it. When it is continuous, we use histogram to show changes in it. This is how it is. So. Examining categorical variables. So here we have our data and uh, we have cut as you already know the data from them and which is cut which is a categorical variable. So if you run this Yeah, so this is for categorical value use bar chart and uh, in bar chart here the bars tell us the observation, how many observation we have in fair, how many we have in good, how many, this is the number of observation. And this one, as we have seen in previous class, this count, the bar chart automatically create this variable count. So here we can use also count from 
from multiplier to calculate the number of each one. So here we have the fear. You can see it's 1610. So fear here, this is, as you can see, is 5,000. So this is approximate value. So that is that for that. So also we can find variation using continuous variable. So for that, we use histogram. And um, in histogram, uh, here we have this. This is it. So mainly what we need to do is just to uh, okay, see this cut is the continuous variable and this one is the width, which tell us how the width of between in the histogram. So when we run this, you can see this. But one thing we should note that here, when we say the width is 0 0.5, it means this data are much together. It, it is not showing some pattern that are inherent that really hide within the data. So they advise you always change the band width in your uh, histogram so that you can see what really the data is. You can narrow down the band width. So here, this is, uh, okay, this is the count also for that. So here, when we uh, put that, so here you can see when we change the band width to 0 0.1 instead of that, it really separate the data. Can you see that? And you can mm -hmm. see here, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, it really separate the data. And we can see here also, we have not uh, used the whole data. We use current, the less than three. That is why here we have only less than three of the current. We are not using the total. We just create a small uh, data from diamond. And uh, we, the data here is small. Yeah, smaller. And this is the current. And we use that. So you can see this is uh, some of the values we can see. So in that case, when you, when you are using this type of things, when you are using large bandwidth, then you, you may experience, I mean, outliers that you may not detect. So it is a good idea to always use some small boundaries so that it can allow you to do that. So histogram is used to map, to use to create only one continuous variable. But what about if you want to match two continuous variables, you want to create two continuous variables. So we use uh, what is called jump pre poly. So John histogram is only to plot one histogram, but when you use the overlay multiple histogram, so here we have carrot and we have cut. So you can see here, we can overlay them here and um, the boundary still is 0 0.1. So that is that. So uh, histogram and uh, pre, John pre, pre, pre poly is used just to do that. But um, yeah. So that is that about that, uh, uh, that. So that is, uh, we need to explore the bandwidth when using continuous variable. So that we need to set different bandwidths that we show. And uh, we can, if we want to use the uh, concatenate or uh, put uh, uh, many, uh, many plots on the standard, we can use this one instead of histogram. So now the next thing after you actually uh, plot your, uh, uh, whether bar chart, whether histogram. The next thing is uh, what questions are you gonna look into this graph? So here we generate graphs. So what are we gonna do? The next thing after the creating the graphs, if you remember, we, when we say that what the, the top three things for a DA is to look up the data, the next thing, computer summary statistic, but here in the book, we have no computer summary statistic, but ideally from the other book here, where we have the modern drive, here, uh, where we say that when you first given the data, just have, I mean, glance at the data using glimpse, you can see that you just glance. The next thing is computer summary statistic of that data. So how can we compute, you can see that we can see the mean, mean score using another function called summarize. So you can see that. After that, then after creating that, then you can plot the data. So these are the three steps here. They said you need to do to do EDA. First thing, look at the data. Second thing, compute summary statistics and find what is the mean, what is the standard deviation. And we have uh, standard functions uh, or packages you can use to calculate that. But here we are not following that. So when you generate your plots, the next thing is to answer questions, find questions from the plot. How can you find questions? So that is what Hadley we can explain here. But um, yep. uh, you need to look at the typical values and unusual values. What do you mean by typical values? 
Typical values are the values that you can really see available from the graph. Unusual values are values that may not really be readily available unless you try to uncover them. So let's quickly go and see them. So typical values include tall bars, short bars, and no bars. What we mean by that is that uh, if we look at this one here, we have a histogram. So you can see tall values. Here we have tall. Here we have tall. Here we have tall. So these are some of the questions, a very interesting question regarding this data. Why are there more diamond at whole carrot and common production of carrot? Why are there more diamond? The next thing is, uh, why are there more diamonds slightly to the right of each peak? If you look at this, if this is a peak, slightly there is more diamond. Can you see? If it is a peak mm -hmm. in, in this in the right, there is more than here. If you look at this peak, there is more than here. If you look at this peak, why is this? If you look at this peak, there is more data than at the back. So that's something that why are there are more diamonds slightly to the right of each peak than they are slightly to the left of two. And again, why are there no diamond bigger than three carats here? Because if you remember, uh, uh, this is one and two. If you remember, we, we are using smaller data set. We are not using the complete data set. So you need to explain, ah, okay, you only take only uh, 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 data set with current between one and two, so you will not see current data. So that is some of the things trying to seem you need to take question. And so what about unusual values? So unusual values are some values that you cannot see. So these are the values that we can see readily. The unusual values are values that you cannot see readily from the graph. So that's why we call bring us to what we call outliers. So uh, uh, Outliers are organization that are unusual, usual, that a point that doesn't seem fit to the pattern. So sometimes other uh, uh, outliers are data errors, other times outliers are important new science. So uh, sometimes people uh, eliminate outliers, which is not a good science because sometimes they say there's something very important. Yes, of course, sometimes there are errors that we need to eliminate. So when you have a lot of data, outliers are sometimes difficult to see in histogram. So this brings us to, uh, Another way in which now this is a histogram that we use using continuous variable, but this histogram will not allow us to see if there's any outlier. So what is the best way to use to show us outlier? Now, if you look at this one, here we use the whole data diamonds and we use the boundary 0 0.5. If you look at this one here, here, uh, Yep, so here, if you look at this here, there's no, nothing like error. I mean, nothing like um, outliers. But when we actually zoom this, when we zoom this one, so there is something called setting coordinate Cartesian to zoom the plot. So when we, how do we set Cartesian coordinate? What we add from the previous class is this Cartesian coordinate. The Y limit, we need to set zero to 50. Here we set the limit 0 to 50 and the x limit 0 to 60. If you look at here, uh, this is 0 to 1200. Can you see it? So here we want to zoom it. So when we zoom it, can you see we can see some outliers here? Yeah, so can you see we can see some outliers which are not available, readily available in this? So when we zoom it here, we have these outliers. But how do we do with the outliers? And another thing you can use is using X lim and Y lim. What X lim and Y lim does is it, it doesn't zoom. It doesn't zoom for you to see this, but rather it used to eliminate any outlier. So when we have the same thing here, we have X lim zero to twenty. This one will cut chop everything that is within zero to twenty. Can you see? All these ones from here are removed. Yep. So we have this one here only. Can you see? So it is not advisable to use epsilon unless those outliers are real errors. But when those outliers are not real errors, they may become useful. So uh, one good thing about ggplot is that when you remove any outlier, it will tell you that uh, you remove an outlier, but uh, you can set 
uh, I think yeah, you can set um, you can set edit edit from here. I, I forget uh, the term. I mean, you can suppress this error. What is that option? I don't. I forget. Anyone can remember? The function for what? To suppress this error, ggplot. If whenever you remove or mm -hmm. cut, it will shows you that you remove some uh, values. So no, there's I, there's I, an I, I, I don't yeah. have I, I don't have um, any idea about that. Um, I forget there is uh, an option that you can typically use so that if you don't need to see this. So that is it. Uh, so what can we do with the outlier? So now here we have seen that we have an outlier and we can see we use this to remove the outlier and we can see that using Cartesian coordinate uh, Cartesian, we can zoom in our plot to see if we have an error. But what can we do with that error? So that's the next thing we're gonna do. It is really advisable when you identify that you have an outlier in your data to repeat your analysis with and with those outliers. What this means is that the first thing is do your analysis with the outliers, record your results. Now go and remove those outliers and run your analysis. And you have two results. Two results means one with outlier, one without an outlier. Now, this question comes this. With outlier, without outlier, do you have minimal effect? With outlier, do you have substantial effect on your result? So if you have minimal effect, you're gonna do something different. If you have substantial effect, you're gonna do something different. So what you're gonna do if you have minimal effect, you can, as they say, you can withdraw the data. So if you have minimal effect on the result and you can't figure out why they are there, it is reasonable to present them with missing value. Yeah, that is just missing any and move on. But if they have a substantial effect in your result, you shouldn't drop with them without justification. You need to figure out what caused them or data error and disclose that why you remove them. So in your EDA exploratory data analysis, two ways to do with that. Replace those uh, those outliers with NE or if they don't have, if they have minimal effect, but when they have substantial effect, no, you shouldn't drop them, but rather you explain uh, why are they there. So this takes us to missing values. So now what we have seen, now we have seen what uh, actually um, variation is, and in variation, we can see that we can have try to find relationship in the variable of categorical variables and we can use bar chart. We can also use continuous variable where we can use histogram to do that. And we have seen also how to deal with the outliers. So the next thing is missing values. So our data are not everyday perfect. They are not, they are messy in their own. So data are messy in their own. So you need to actually find the way in which you deal with their uh, missing data. So the first thing you can do is drop the entire row with strange values, which is not recommended. The second thing is recommend that is replacing the individual value with missing value. So this is it. Yeah. So if you can look at this, uh, that outliers we have there, uh, drop the entire row with the strange values, which is not recommended. It's, if you look at this, we have our diamond data set. We filter those once between two and one. If you look at it here, so here we filter anything that is less than one day. Yes, anything that is less than here with those outlier, we remove it. Anything that is here, we remove it. We only use the data that's between here and here. That is the row. So that is why here we have, you can see we are using it, we are removing the row with that values, and now we plot in our histogram only this one. That is draw the entire row with the strange value. Here we drop the entire row, and you can see when we plot here, we don't have that. This is the second step which is recommended, replacing the huge unusual value with missing values. So this is it. So those unusual values we use here, again, this is our original data set, but we want to replace those unusual values with NA. So we can use, the good thing is to use mutate. We want to replace Y with other values. So we want to replace if else is one Y is within this range, less than three or greater than 20, replace with NA, else return the value of Y. 
So if anything is within this range, here or there, within this range, and this here, replace it with any else, return the original value of y. So that is how it is done here. Uh, yep, so that is how it is done here. And uh, oh yeah, so this is the error. So we can suppress here. Uh, this is what I was asking you, Alan. Yep. Yeah, so we can. So. But uh, how, how do you suppress it? I've never actually seen it. Yeah, uh, well, okay, yeah. You can set NA. Oh, okay. Yep. So when we did the setting here, right? Uh, yep. See? Yeah, so can you can see we can we suppress this uh, stuff like that. So that is it. Yep, so that's about missing value. So the next thing is covariation. Oh, my God. Mm. Covariation. So um, <laughs> I don't know why this one is uh, the next slide. So the next thing after looking at the uh, variation is covariation. So covariation allows us to see relationship between variables. As we have seen, variation describes behavior within variables, but covariation describes behavior between variables. And the best way to find covariation is to realize the relationship between two or more variables. Yeah, because yes, of course, we are dealing with two or more variables. So if you want to find any relationship between them, so find the uh, variation, find the relationship between them. So how do you find the relationship between them? It also depends on what are those variables. They can be one categorical variable and one continuous variable, or two categorical variables or two continuous variables. So with that, you can have different ways to deal with that with covariation. So let's quickly go there. So covariation, as you can see, this is it. So here we can have two variables, categorical and continuous. So here we have, we have our data, which is this, and we have price. So uh, here, if you look at this one here, we have price, which is actually, uh, uh, continuous and we have cut, cut which is actually uh, continue, I mean categorical variable so we can use jump this one that we have seen there to actually load uh, find understanding of a combination when we ever we have categorical and continuous variable so this allow us to use jump pre flip pre poly to visualize to find the relationship between that but typically with this, if you look at this one, uh, they are saying here, if you look at this, the price, and this one, this line, they are showing the, cut, the categorical variable. So, but the problem is here that it is hard to see the different, uh, it is hard to see the difference in distribution because the overall count differs so much. Because the count here, it differs from different this, from individual. Okay. So, so it, it is hard to see the variation. So the best way to do that is to use, to, uh, instead, instead of using count here, is to introduce something called density here. So to make the comparison easier, we need to swap what is displayed on the y-axis. Instead of displaying count, we we'll display density, which is the count standardized, so that the area under each frequency polygon is one. So when we run that, in the same thing, but we just add this one instead of automatically allowing this one to use count. So here, when we run this, so you can see this, the difference is not too much. We can actually be able to uh, make the comparison between them. Mm -hmm. And also another thing we need to consider, oh, another way to show a relationship between a categorical variable and continuous variable is to use what's called box floats. Yeah, uh, jump box floats is used also to do that. You can see here the X is the categorical variable and the Y here is the continuous variable. So this is it. This is a price. This is the categorical variable. And uh, 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 in the book, we it really explain how box float works. Oh, we have 10 minutes, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I can, I can extend for some more 10 minutes. Yeah, we have 10 minutes, so I'm rushing. So if you see, um, one way to explain, to find the relationship between categorical and continuous variable is to jump project here. 
and we put there the continuous variable and here we put the criteria type. Another way we should say that this is using a uh, box plot. So this is it. We see much less information about the distribution, but the box plots are much more punctual, so we can easily compare them. Here it is readily not, again, readily visible to make any comparison, but box plots allow us to make much more comparison because it can, you can see the median, you can see uh, this uh, the outliers and stuff like that. So not cut is ordered factor here. Here, but one thing with uh, box plot is that the categorical variable it assumes to be ordered. Ordered. What we mean by that is fair is it's less than this. This is less than this. What about if you have your data which is not ordered in this way? You need to reorder it. So that is why we say this is due to the fact that GDPR takes into account the order of the factor levels, not the order of the you observe your data. So this is the order of the factor level. So when you have a data that is not ordered in that way, how can you order it? This is an example. If you look at this, we have class, we have Y here. Here, if you look at this, we with this, this is actually, uh, you can see two seater, two, we have different, different box flow which are not ordered. We want a way in which we order them in which this one is maybe this is greater than this, this is greater than this is in that way. In that way, we can use what we call a reorder. So you can reorder the class and this and this in the median. So you can see these are the kind of things you reorder. So reorder box plot with this notion. So yeah. So also again, you can use coordinate plif. The something if you have your these values, categorical variables, you can see that here we have the values, they, comp they, they I mean, come close to one another. It's not good to do that. So you can use coordinate plif. So this one will plif the coordinate. It will change them to become in this way rather than that way. So um, that is this. Then the next one is two categorical variables. So how can we show two categorical variables? How can we show the relationship of two categorical variables? The first approach is using jump count. Yeah, that's the way you see the first approach is using jump count. If you look at this one, we have this cut is categorical and color is categorical variable. So how can we show the relationship between them? Using jump count, uh, the size of each cycle in the display, how many of vibration occur at each combination of the values. So if you look at this, we have this fair, good, very good, the card, and we have the color. So the size here display how it displays how many observations occur. So here you can see we have many, many observations. So that is that for that reason, jump. And also, uh, covariation, what I fear is a strong correlation between specific S value and specific Y value. So when we have this strong, we have this one, so it means a strong covariation here, and maybe those one we have big values. The second approach is from duplier that you use jump title. So the first approach to uh, find the relationship between category two categorical values is using jump count. The another one is using uh, from duplier. So if you look at this one here, from duplier, this is our data, diamond. And the next thing is you use count from duplier, uh, using count here, yeah, using count from duplier. Yeah, so you use count and put your two categorical variables and map those categorical variables here. So here you can see we have those categorical variables. So here it create a kind of um, heat maps. Yeah, this is called heat maps. So here when it is shaded more, we have strong, I mean, correlation between those two variables. And where we have less, I mean, less shaded, now we don't have that one. So, so that is that for Two categorical variables. So the next thing is two continuous variables. So how can you show relationship between two continuous variables? So as we see, the first approach to show that is using scatter plot, as we have already known. But carat here is continuous and price here is continuous. So when we have the uh, that is obvious. We have seen that uh, with the we have been doing scatter plot jump plot to show a relationship between two continuous variables. However. 
scatter plot become less useful at the side of your data set grows because look at this this is blood you cannot know what this means so one option is to use uh, alpha aesthetic to add transparency so you can see here we add alpha one over this to add transparency to our data so still this transparency can be challenging for very large data set so another solution is to use bin with jump bin so jump bin is another uh, is another ggplot uh, from uh, 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 to plot and another one is jump hex so instead to use this option to show if you have beta to show use transparency if you have more legit data set they advise to use this or this this one where it does divide the plane into rectangles count the number so this is how it does so if you look at this one ggplot data smaller we jump by two this is our uh, continuous variable this is continuous variable this is the second option hex this is uh, smaller data this is continuous this is continuous so when we prove them if you look at them okay if you look at them this is using um yeah this is this is the first one this is the second one why is using hex if you look at this is hex hex but this one is not using that but truly uh i do not cannot tell or explain vividly why this one is better than this one but what this does is that they say John Bean divide the plane into rectangles as we can see divide the planes into rectangles uh, count the number of cases in each rectangle and then uh, by different map the number of cases each rectangle to fill so here each rectangle to present how many number of continuous variable do we have in each values and price and that correspond to carrot and price and um, this is a useful alternative to join point yes as we have seen we say that join point is one of option to use to plot uh, two scatter two continuous variable but in the presence of over plotting yeah so here you can see we have over plotting but still jump head is being avoid the visual artifact sometimes generated by the very rectangular alignment of join bind so this sentence i don't understand what it means so to avoid some problem here that is why in ggplot also they create this one so can anybody explain the difference between this one and this no no i can't i can't, I can't really explain that never use those ones okay so yeah so that is that for that one. and finally as uh, chapter in chapter seven is ggplot core so what does that mean is like uh, he explained this is how we call our ggplot we provide the data we provide the mapping and that, that. so he cautioned us that sometimes we're gonna we are not going to do that we just provide the data we just provide the aesthetic without using data is supposed to this mapping is supposed to this, and we just put the bandwidth here here without using that so he uh, explain this is how to call gg plus sometimes without uh, explicitly stating that and uh, uh, also hardly uh, pointed out that uh, you need to watch transition when using gg plot because if you look at this here here we are using this where then this to start the layers in gg plot but finally when we want to plot we do not use these stuff we do not use this stuff but we use the plus so how do you say he wished to have this here but the problem is these things have been created before the creation of ggplot oh yeah uh, so you cannot use them so he wish how did he say that he wish that we can just put this one also at the same time here just to do that but uh, since this one has already predate this one, so that's why you cannot do that. So he said, you need to always watch. Uh, when you do, you start this, so you put this one at the end. So that is the end of my presentation, and it is exactly uh, uh, one hour. Uh, any questions? So uh, we were not able to see, go through the questions of chapter seven, and uh, what we'll do, I will actually prefer the questions and the answers of chapter seven, and I will put in the Slack in our group, 
So anybody who has uh, some question, you can go through them. And uh, I think uh, by the next lesson, we may not uh, go through the question. We can just go to the next uh, presentation. Uh, anybody can go through those uh, answers that I will provide. If there is any question, you can contact me. Thank you very much for uh, listening. And uh, any question, free to take question and answer if I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very detailed presentation. So, uh, guys, uh, what, what, what do you think? Do, you, do, you, do we have some questions now? Do we uh, take the questions to Slack and answer them from there? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, as we already said, it's already time. So, uh, I think we should better, I mean, for some people that have already, like you now, you say you're going, <laughs> you spend what you want. Yeah. So we may inconvenience other people if we pass one hour. So I think the best thing is um, uh, uh, I will just uh, share the question, I mean, question and answers for the chapter. So everybody can go through, but uh, question regarding uh, presentation, now we can do some discussions on that, if any. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Um, yeah, and the presentation was very clear. I don't really have any questions on the presentation per se. Okay, hi, and Ruth? Yeah, me neither, no questions, thank you. Ah, okay, so, all right. So, Alan, thank you for giving me this opportunity as facilitator to present this chapter. Uh, no, thank you, thank you very much to you too. Very good. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm actually very, very surprised you covered all this in one one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and you know what? I, I I I when you sent me that message, I told you like I I I started preparing the slide, and when I sent you a message, where is the slide for for the R for that? I don't have the slide. I don't I don't even prepare it. I quickly go to the GitHub and clone the repo. <laughs> I, I I don't even know how to do the Darian presentation. <laughs> That is why I was having this kind of problem. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for doing. Yeah, we learn as we go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. definitely.